Yeah, hello everyone. My name is uh, Simon Pierce. And uh, I've come here today to talk about managing and uh, securing Kubernetes secrets. So I work for a company called Sys11, situated in Berlin. And uh, we're a managed hosting provider. We've been managing various types of Linux containers for the past 15 years, roughly now, and uh, running Kubernetes since about five years. Um, we've got about 400 uh, Kubernetes clusters that we run for uh, customers. And this number is like rapidly growing. And uh, we do a lot of workshops and consulting with customers. And one of the questions that uh, often uh, gets asked is, how do I go about managing secrets in Kubernetes? And yeah, this basically brought me onto the topic to uh, speak a bit about this and to uh, um, put some research into this. How can this be done? I mean, there's multiple ways, of course, of doing this. And of course, my talk is opinionated because I've made a choice, um, but I would like to show you like uh, different ways how you can uh, do this. So yeah, let's get started. So first, a bit about me. So I already mentioned that I've been working for Sys11 since 2013. And uh, my hobbies are anything Linux related, so automating stuff around Linux and building stuff on top of Linux, I really like that. Tinkering with my Raspberry Pis at home, so I do a lot of uh, K3S, building containers and home automation and all that sort of stuff. And if I'm not doing that, I like to get really muddy in the forests of Brandenburg, doing cyclocross and participating in gravel events. Okay, so uh, the agenda today is going to be uh, Kubernetes secrets, the uh, current situation, where are we at the moment? Securing secrets. How can you uh, do this currently? Options for uh, managing secrets in Kubernetes. External secrets, uh, KMS, so key, uh, key management uh, systems. And uh, last but not least, I would like to show you a, a quick demo, if everything works out. So let's start off with Kubernetes secrets, the current situation. So. The current situation, as most of you probably know, we have base encoded, base 64 encoded files. So this basically uh, gives us no form of encryption. Um, it's basically anyone that has access to these files can access your secrets. So they can gain access to any tokens you may be using for uh, repositories, access to uh, any clouds that you're using if you're uh, using any API tokens there, and maybe even certificates and uh, build a phishing website or something with your um, certificates. So this is bad, right? They are also stored unencrypted in the um, Kubernetes uh, key value store, etcd. So a lot of uh, managed providers have already addressed this issue. They've like started to uh, encrypt etcd, which uh, I will uh, speak about briefly in a, uh, later on. But if you're running your own Kubernetes out of the box, if you're just using like kubeadm or the majority of other tools to set up your cluster, you will have an unencrypted etcd. And uh, you normally take snapshots of your etcd, hopefully you do, I mean, I hope everyone does. And uh, these snapshots might be in an S3 bucket, on a disk somewhere. If anyone can access these, they can theoretically gain access to your data. Anyone that can theoretically create a pod can also read secrets. So this could also um, be an issue. And uh, anyone with API access uh, can theoretically also retrieve or also modify uh, a secret in any way. This could also be like bad. So how can you go about uh, improving this situation and securing secrets? So the number one, of course, is using RBAC. So you can use like role-based access control, um, you can enforce a um, least privilege concept, and you can use this to uh, improve uh, the situation. You see a lot of people, and I've also seen this, I'm afraid, a lot with people I've been talking to that just decide to hand out like cluster admin privileges. Yeah, it's easy, it works, it's definitely a really bad idea. Don't do this. Ensure that um, the only place I believe that you should really have like cluster admin privileges is for your CD tool or for your CI CD tool that's going to deploy and create namespace and other things. The majority of developers and people interacting with your Kubernetes infrastructure do not need cluster admin permissions to do this. 
You can also restrict a secret access to specific containers. This is also, uh, of course, possible and should be done. Um, you can, like, uh, you should create your own service accounts and make sure that these uh, have the correct permissions that they need to uh, do whatever they need to do, but they definitely shouldn't have uh, full access to everything within the cluster. And you can also use encryption at rest for your ETCD. If you um, look at the Kubernetes official documentation, one of the first things you'll come across when you see encryption at rest will be to create the uh, actual keys to encrypt ETCD on the API server. I kind of consider this as something that you can maybe use for testing, but otherwise I think every attacker that gains access to your system is gonna think this is a joke, right? I mean, you've gone all the way to encrypt your data and then you put the keys on the same system that you've uh, used to encrypt. This is definitely not a good way to do it. The only thing you're really solving there is that your backups are gonna, gonna be encrypted. Everything else is definitely not solved. The proper way to do this would be to have your encryption key in an external system and not within your cluster. This can be done, there are various ways of doing this. It's not the uh, scope of this talk, but uh, there's definitely ways of doing this, and some of them are already outlined in the official Kubernetes documentation in case you're interested. So you can use an external uh, secret store, and this is, um, what this talk's gonna be about today as well, using external secret stores uh, for your uh, secrets. So which options do you currently have for managing secrets? So I basically tried to split this into two because I believe there's like two general or generic ways of doing this which you can decide off um, at the end. Um, I also favorize one which I'll tell you in a minute, but uh, you can, number one is you can store the encrypted secret in your Git. I mean, you have to store it somewhere. It's definitely an improvement in, on uh, putting the unencrypted version into Git. In my opinion, it's still not perfect, but we'll go uh, into detail with this later on. So your, uh, it's encrypted when it's stored in Git, so you can't read it. Ooh. Ah, okay. Uh, you decrypt it with a, a sealed secret in your Kubernetes cluster. So at some point of time, your CI tool is going to deploy, and uh, then you basically need to decrypt your secret, otherwise no one's going to be able to read it. Software you can use to do this is Mozilla Sops, or you can also use Bitnami sealed secrets. The trade-off probably here is you need to deal with another set of keys somewhere. So also Bitnami is going to need some form of key to be able to uh, decrypt the secrets. And Mozilla's got a similar approach. So you're probably gonna back up these keys somewhere else as well, so you've got something else then to deal with. It's definitely a feasible option, and it's a lot better than just like store, uh, storing your base64 encrypted secrets, but in my opinion, uh, there's a better way of doing it. I think the best way of doing it is to only store a reference to your actual secret in Git, and not the secret itself. So, only the reference uh, of the secret is stored in Git, and the secret, the same as in the first uh, example, is uh, then created in the uh, Kubernetes cluster when you need it. So in general, the uh, values are then fetched from an external secret store. So there's various ways of doing this, and uh, I will show you one later on in the uh, demonstration. So, where would you actually go about storing external secrets? So in general, but there's multiple ways of doing this. And if you're running on one of the large hyperscalers, you're probably lucky. If you want to use these things and you're not afraid of any form of vendor lock-in, then you could definitely use something like AWS, KMS. On Google Cloud, there's something similar. Uh, there's the uh, KMS GKE. And Azure also have a key vault service which you can use. So these will take the burden away from having to um, sort this out yourself and deal with it. But of course, uh, you're basically locked in with that provider. So if that's okay with you, then fine. And another option which I would like to show today would be to use HashiCorp Vault. So um, you can use uh, HashiCorp Vault also, of course, with Azure. They have an HTTP offering as well now. Uh, but you can also use it on-prem, anywhere where you'd like to install it. It can be used. So that's like really helpful, and it's also fairly simple to set up as well. It's not like super difficult. It takes a bit of time to get your head around the way it actually works, but uh, it definitely works fairly well. So 
next up with how are you actually going to synchronize the secret that you've now stored in your uh, KMS system? So we've got it in Vault. How do we actually get it into the Kubernetes cluster itself? So also here, there's multiple software that can help you do this. Um, there's the Vault Agent Sidecar Injector. I haven't actually used this myself because I don't really like the sidecar approach because you need a sidecar, of course, in every part to be able to do this. Um, it definitely works, uh, and I've uh, talked to a few people that use it, so it's definitely uh, good. You can also use the Argo CD Vault plugin to retrieve uh, your secrets from Vault. Uh, or the external secrets operator. There's also going to be a talk at KubeCon about the external secrets operator. So if anyone wants to get some more information about this, please go and visit that talk. It's something about protecting your crown jewels or something. So this could also be a very interesting talk. I originally built up my talk around the external secret operator as well. But I decided to change it after a colleague pointed out to me in a meeting that there's uh, a part of the Kubernetes SIG uh, group is the secret store CSI driver. And there's one uh, function that I really like about the um, secret store CSI driver, which I'll point out during the uh, demo, which I think is like a huge uh, benefit that you have here. So secret store CSI driver. As I pointed out, it's a Kubernetes SIG, so it's got a good uh, chance of actually uh, staying there and uh, becoming um, uh, um, a software that you can actually adapt and use. It's still in beta at the moment, but it works very well. So you, it allows you to synchronize with Kubernetes secrets if you want to. It uh, mounts secrets to a pod using a CSI volume. And this is one of the uh, takeaways that I would like to give you. It's, I find this very interesting and also a nice way of actually solving this uh, problem. You can mount multiple secrets as store objects as a single volume. So if your pod requires multiple secrets uh, to run, you can do all of this in one volume. So you don't need to like configure multiple volumes to get this um, job done, which I also really liked. And it also supports uh, multiple external secret providers. So all of the secret providers that I showed you in the uh, prior slides are supported, and you can use any one, or you can even mix them as well. So you can interchange between the two, which can also make like migrating to a different cloud platform or running infrastructure on different clouds a lot more easier, because there's not much uh, code that you need to change. And you also have Linux and Windows container support, which can also be interesting for anyone that's uh, running Windows containers. And it's still an alpha feature, but you can also um, do automatic secret rotation. So if any of you have got like a, um, the needs to uh, regularly rotate your secrets, this can also be done, and I'll show this uh, during the uh, demo. So this is basically what's this happening over time? Oh. So this is basically what it looks like, the secret store uh, volume. So on the right on the left, we've got our kubelet running on every uh, compute node within the cluster. This can then uh, communicate with my uh, secret store uh, CSI driver. And the secret store CSI driver then can use gRPC to communicate with the secret store CSI provider, which in my case is uh, Vault. And then you have a service account, which your uh, pod is uh, generally started with. And this service account can then be uh, utilized to authenticate against HashiCorp Vault. So HashiCorp Vault has like a built-in mechanism called Kubernetes authentication, which you can then use. When the secret comes back, it uh, is re retrieved hand it back over to the secret store uh, CSI driver. The secret store CSI driver can uh, create a tempfs volume. Uh, it gets mounted into the pod, and the secret is written to that volume. Once uh, you destroy your uh, deployment, the, or everything goes. So uh, this is also really good. You, you directly delete everything, and uh, there's no secrets left, which I think is like awesome. And as I said, the, the Vault bit can uh, be interchanged. I just like focus on Vault here in this talk, but the, you can definitely change this uh, if you would like to.
Okay, so uh, otherwise, if I didn't do some preparation work, this demo would have taken like way too long and I would probably uh, be standing here an hour uh, showing you uh, things. So I did a bit of preparation and just to uh, make sure that you know what I've done, I quickly want to uh, go through what I uh, did in the cluster. So I used the uh, lab cluster that we have running in our cloud and I uh, used um, the Helm chart from Vault to install Vault with CSI secrets. So we have three replicas of Vault and CSI secrets uh, is enabled. I uh, use the Terraform module that HashiCorp also provides to configure uh, Vault. So I uh, basically uh, run Vault with OIDC enabled. Uh, I activated the Kubernetes uh, authentication. So the Kubernetes authentication basically um, takes the public IP, your outgoing IP of your um, uh, masters, uh, of your control plane components, sorry, uh, or the load balancer that's in front of your control plane components, and it uses this to um, authenticate, and it also has the CA certificate of your um, Kubernetes cluster. So it can verify that this is the correct uh, cluster. Then you have an authentication role. And this authentication role is then mapped to a service account in a specific namespace. And this, again, then is tied to a policy to access uh, the actual uh, secret. So these can be very fine-grained, the policies involved. You can set them even up so you can only read a single secret. Okay, so let's uh, try and uh, show you a demo then. Okay. So I'll switch to the uh, command line. I probably have to make this a bit bigger. Is this big enough? Yep. Okay, so first off, I'm going to install uh, the Helm chart with the uh, CSI secret store. This will give us uh, uh, the daemon set. And I'll quickly show you the values YAML. There's not much to it, really. So I just like ensured that the CSI secret driver doesn't go on any of my storage nodes, which I have in the lab. And I also enabled the um, secret zinc, which I said was an alpha feature. And I also changed the um, rotation um, poll interval because it's normally two minutes. And if it only polls the secret every two minutes, it may take too long until we actually see the changes if I update the secret. So just to make sure that the demo runs smoothly, I change this. OK, so now we should have a, a daemon set. So let's have a look. So we should have some pods here. Yeah, here's our daemon set. Uh, we should have a, a CSI driver. Oops, sorry. CSI driver, so if you look here, there's the uh, secret store CSI driver. This is then responsible for uh, creating the uh, actual volume. And uh, next up, we also have a uh, CRD. So we have two CRDs, uh, which we've also uh, installed. So this is basically uh, the whole uh, installation. And uh, I've prepared um, two mini uh, applications. Well, actually, it's a lie. I didn't actually build them myself. Actually, ChatGPT built them. I thought I'd give this a try, and it actually worked. <laughs> so, uh, and I just deploy both of them, and I'll show you the YAML afterwards so we get them deployed because they, I need to create a certificate in the uh, background. And I've got basically uh, two uh, versions of my application, which I would like to show you. So I'll deploy this first and then the volume version afterwards, and then I'll quickly show you the uh, actual YAML. So let's have a look at the YAML. Um, so what have, I got, what have I got here? So I've got like a, a deployment file. Um, there's the Docker Alpine, which is just basically the image which I'm using with a bit of Go code. Uh, there's an ingress rule and a secret store. So ingress rule is fairly standard. I'm not going to go into this. I'll just show you the deployment uh, YAML first. And so you can see the service account that I'm going to use in uh, Vault is already outlined here. And uh, you can already see that uh, in this version, I'm actually using um, um, an environment variable, so basically standard that you already know from Kubernetes. I'm reading the web app secret value from a secret key ref, and um, it's uh, web app secret, and the key is password. The new thing that you probably have not seen yet is the volume. So if you look here, I have a volume which I'm mounting here to MNT secret store. And um, this volume, yeah, of course, sorry. This, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, I can just about still see. So um, you can see here that I am now using the driver secret store CSI for uh, this volume. So this is basically um, my deployment. And the only uh, ch big change to a normal secret is this part next to the volume. So we have like a new um, API resource which we deployed with our CRD called secret provider class. And you can see in the spec field, if you look, I'm using the provider vault. So this can be changed against any other provider. I'm writing a secret object with the data key password. And object name is going to be uh, web app pass. And the secret name is uh, web app secret. You can see my vault address where I'm reading it uh, from. And um, the bottom is the data that is going to go on uh, the actual volume. So the secret path here is going to be my path in vault. This is what I actually forgot to show you, which I wanted to show you first, actually. But I didn't do this. So we can quickly have a look. Um, if you look in the, at my vault installation, then you will see this is basically the uh, vault installation. And uh, if you look at access, I have configured the uh, Kubernetes authentication here. And the Kubernetes authentication has the three applications. So these two we're currently look at, looking at today. And you can see that uh, this is bound to the service account that I just showed you. So you've got a bound service account name. And you've got a bound uh, service account namespace as well, which we're using. And underneath, at the bottom, you will see to actually uh, read the secret, you have the policy that I was speaking about. The policy in this case is like super simple. Uh, it's just like a, um, a reader um, policy which allows me to read uh, any secret. So the beginning is like the secret engine in Vault, and it allows you to read any secret underneath this. You could, uh, in a production environment, you would restrict this. You would not allow all of the secrets under KDS. I just did this for, the, for this uh, demonstration. So at the end, this is my secret. Uh, here it is. So this is a secret, uh, KubeCon 2023, that we're going to see. OK, so let's see uh, what our actual deployment uh, looks like. So number one, uh, we should have a pod going, right? So let's have a look. Deployment env, get pods. Yeah, we should have a secret. Yeah, we have a secret. Let's have a look at this secret. Oops. And decode it. You can see if we're decoding the secret in the namespace, you can see it's the same secret that we were using uh, before. And uh, we also should have. Um, let's have a look. Sorry. OK. And we should also have a volume here. Uh, this, of course, is a wrong one. Um, we have a volume here, and we can also read the secret from the volume. So if we basically do a cat onto the file system, ah, then we can see that you will also be able to see the secret, which is written to a file to this tempfs volume that uh, the um, external secrets provider created. And we also should have the environment variable as well, because I said, let's uh, please write it to the environment. So if we have a look at the environment, we should also be able to see it here. So this basically works as uh, a regular secret that you would have deployed into uh, a Kubernetes cluster as you're already doing at the moment. Uh, there's nothing different except like that you've got this uh, specific uh, volume here. This is the only uh, difference. OK. So this is done, and now I would like to show the second version of my uh, brilliant application. And the second version is the only difference is we're also using a service account, the same as in the other one. It's only got a different namespace. Uh, it's got a 2.0 uh, version, and the only big difference is the volume mount. So I'm just using the volume mount, but I'm not like exporting a secret here. There's no environments. There's nothing else involved. So uh, if you look here, you can see this is basically also the same. So if we look at this, then you will see there's going to be one big difference. The big difference is that we don't have a secret. 
or we have like one secret, but it's like the TLS certificate. There's no secrets involved, so nothing has got written to Kubernetes. But we also have the same uh, volume, right? So let's see. Uh, we also have a volume, and we've written secret to a volume. So we can see uh, the secret here and retrieve it. So the takeaway here is we have not written the secret in the second iteration of our application to Kubernetes. We've only written it to a volume. So it's not landed in ETCD. There's no way of retrieving this from ETCD because it's not there. The only big difference is that you're going to have to uh, maybe change the way that your application retrieves the secret. If you're building your own applications, this should be possible fairly easy. There's uh, also, if someone can't access into the pod, there's also no way of retrieving this uh, secret either. So uh, it's definitely uh, got a higher grade of security than the first uh, solution. But sometimes it may not be feasible. Sometimes you may still want the regular Kubernetes secret object. Then you've got both ways that you can use. The last thing that I would like to show is uh, how can you rotate the secret. So um, we've got the secret here. And I'm just going to create a new version of my secret. And Kubernetes. So create a new version. And uh, as you can see, I have like these two uh, applications also in a, a browser. So here you can already see that the uh, secret has um, not been updated. It's still on KubeCon 2023. It takes like a few uh, seconds as well till it does get updated. On the second uh, application, I'm basically just reading uh, the file. So we should see this uh, change in a few seconds time. So depending on when you deployed it, of course, when I did the rehearsal, it worked really quickly. This could take up to a minute. So if the minute's just gone over, then it could take a few seconds more. But we should see this secret getting updated. So what is the big difference? This, uh, the two differences are the secret in Kubernetes will get updated. But because the pod has already mounted the secret, the pod will not reflect the change. If my application is reading the secret regularly from the, uh, from the volume, then you will get the change without having to restart uh, the pod in any way. So this is possible. So let's have a look and see if we can uh, get. So you can already see here, here's the secret that I showed you from the pod number one. So it already knows about this uh, new change. If I go back to the browser, you should see that this application will have the new version of my secret. It's been automatically updated. But this is, of course, also the way I built this, also a bad style, because uh, if you would do something like this, <laughs> oops. <laughs> so don't do this at home. That's only for demo purposes. Um, you, here, you won't see any. Uh, changes on the secret until I actually restart the pod. So there's basically, uh, you can roll over your pods, of course. Let's roll it out and change it. Or there's also another option that I came across while I was doing some uh, research for this talk. There's, I can't quite remember the name of the software. It starts with an S, but I can't remember the name. Sorry, I can uh, post it later on, though. Uh, there's a pod which actually watches secrets. Uh, controller within Kubernetes and then automatically restarts deployment. So there's a lot of software uh, around on GitHub that actually addresses these problems as well if you actually need to. So uh, here we should also see the change being reflected now. Okay, so now we've done our password rotation and all of our pods now have the new password. So um, this is basically um, the uh, end of my uh, demo. And um, thank you very much for uh, listening and for being here today. It's been uh, really nice to be able to present here. And uh, do you have any questions? Is there anything that someone would like to ask? Yes? Sorry, I guess a silly question. Uh, in the second uh, I guess it's a silly question. In the second case, uh, when uh, the password is stored only on the volume, uh, the password actually changes on the volume and just the application doesn't see it? Or 
You yeah, so um, the uh, controller changes the secret on the volume, but uh, the secret, which is also like synchronized in the first case, is mounted into the pod, so it doesn't get changed until the pod restarts and mounts the secret again. In the second uh, version of the application, the application just reads the secret from the volume, so it automatically gets the change straight away without any restart. Okay. So anything that's mounted statically into a pod needs the uh, restart, otherwise it won't work. So it's like a snapshot of a Well, it's basically, I just it's changed like the way to retrieve the secret, basically. This is, this is the only uh, difference. So you probably have to, or you would have to make sure that your application does this. Either it would do it on start, and then you would also have to restart your pod, or it would do it like every five minutes or something. Then the ah, okay, so if application's smart enough to yes. do a change, it will. Yeah. yeah, then it could just read it every five minutes and, and notice a change. Okay. Or you can even use one of these controllers you can find, and then you would also have like the same uh, change. You just put like a label onto your secret. The controller watches this secret. When it sees the secret has changed, it just restarts. The you deployment. can monitor file events. Uh, for the yeah, yeah. Any other questions? So as part of the motivation of your talk, you have mentioned that storing secrets in Kubernetes is not a good idea, right? Um, but now you have the CSI driver running that somehow needs to communicate with the vault. So how do you manage the secret then? Um, it doesn't actually need um, a direct secret uh, to communicate. It basically uses the Kubernetes authentication mechanism in vault and the CA to verify that it's coming from the correct cluster. So vault is then basically your source of truth. And then it only allows uh, through the policy and through the um, role, the app role which is configured, it only allows that service account from that namespace to communicate with uh, and retrieve the secret. And it would be read-only anyway, so you could not change anything there. Because as you saw in the policy, I made sure that everything's like read-only. My policy was like a bit loose. It could be made tighter than, than uh, I did in this example. Hi. It's actually a follow-up question from that. How does that add security then? Because it kind of likes resembles sealed secrets, so if now we have a sec problem of handling that service account token, right? Yeah, um, so uh, of course you, do, you don't actually need the token itself, you only need the service account and the Kubernetes authentication. You can use the service account token on top, otherwise it uses basically the, uh, it can use also the token API to do this. So I think the major uh, benefit is that you're basically uh, making your secrets external so you can like reuse them in multiple clusters if you need to. So sometimes you have like common assets, like maybe pull secrets or um, uh, certain um, cloud API tokens that you might need in multiple clusters. And you basically, if someone breaks into your cluster, he can't directly access everything. It's a lot more difficult to uh, access the data than in Vault for the um, attacker than having like all the secrets at once and you can just like read them and then write them into uh, a YAML file and take everything. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, if I have a policy of uh, you know enabling a key rotation uh, as per compliance regulation, uh, in that case, uh, in that case uh, what, what would be the best practice uh, to adapt? Uh, for uh, you, ha you have like a, a backup. Uh, just a key rotation. For example, as per the policy, um, the keys need to be rotated in a, a certain um, uh, life cycle time. Uh, probably uh, three months once or six months once. We need to enable the keys sh should be renewed as. Yeah, so you can basically either use Vault API to renew these, yes. or you can yeah. basically use the UI as I was using now. You would basically rotate them and ensure that the uh, new version then gets synchronized to your Kubernetes cluster, and then you could use it there. Okay. So that's, that's like one of the like major benefits that it's like a lot more easier to rotate secrets, which I'm afraid most people don't actually do because it becomes like a big operational task and everyone's like, oh, what's going to break if I rotate the secret? And people just leave them like that and yeah. P uh, workers change, uh, they leave the company, they may have had access to this. It's definitely a bad idea. All right. Uh, I, there, it seems to be quite a lot of questions, but we are kind of like invading on the, yeah, yeah. the next figure. So one last question. So I know there are some limitations, and I will just follow up a previous question. So not every application are able to read it, let's say, from that. Um, when there are applications, for example, with subpath, 
you know, you mount it as a sapat, the volume, then I know there are limitations. And I'm interested in what is the solution to restart the pod in order to take the rollout of the new password. So uh, what, what ways are there, what solutions there are to, to restart? Because this is a limitation of the CSI. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, I, either, as I said, you use the second example and you uh, are able to retrieve it from a volume, then you don't have to restart the pod. If you're using a secret which is mounted in, you're not going to get away with restarting the pod. So hopefully you've got multiple replicas, so you start them one by one, and then you can either do it like I did, which probably you don't want to do in your production environment, or you use one of the controllers I suggested and put a label on your secret, then automatically your uh, pods are going to get restarted. Or you redeploy a new version of your deployment and add an additional additional label, uh, a git commit, hash, or something, this will also have the same effect. It will restart the pods if you add an, uh, an additional label. You, uh, you can do it via CI, but there's something in your GitOps workflow, of course, that you're going to need to build in. It's not going to uh, take care of everything. So this like, solves part of the problem, but it, of course, doesn't solve everything. There's always uh, yeah, some glitch. Yeah, the CI can do it. That's why I don't really believe it's like a manual task, but it's like kind of, yeah, something additional that you have to do. All right, thank you okay, very much. Okay, thank you very much.